Hi everyone, Bishop Keith here again with my reflection for Wednesday and Holy Week. I do hope that you are enjoying these reflections and that they are helpful for you as you continue to prayerfully reflect on Jesus' last days. Today, I want to help us to think together on a very important meal that Jesus has before his crucifixion. I'm not talking about the Last Supper. We will look at that tomorrow. But before Jesus has that Last Supper, with his disciples, he retires to Bethany. Here he was in the house of a person called Simon the leper. We're not sure who he really was. It's likely that he was a person that Jesus healed, um, and maybe he was in the Gospels, or maybe he wasn't in the Gospels. We're not really sure. What is recorded, though, is that Jesus has this meal, and that Matthew and Mark felt compelled to recall it, albeit with their own take on the events. John has the meal in Bethany as well, but this time it's at the house of Mary, Martha and Lazarus. Luke has a similar story, but it's way before uh, the time of Holy Week, and it's still in a house with a person, a host called Simon, but it's completely dislocated from the events of Holy Week, and so we won't really reflect on that much at all. While the Last Supper concentrates on Jesus and the disciples, that is the men, in the meal, Jesus focuses on the arrival of a woman who anoints him. Matthew and Mark have a nameless woman coming into the house of Simon the leper. In John, Jesus is eating at the home of Martha, Mary and Lazarus, and it is Mary who anoints Jesus. We note in Matthew and Mark that the woman, uh, and that the woman who anoints Jesus' head, in the Gospels of John and Luke, Mary and the nameless woman anoint Jesus' feet. We'll come back to that a little bit later. The differences reminds us that the stories have probably been conflated and that the evangelists have picked up on the various stories to make their own points. Professor Levine, in her commentary, notes that in telling the stories of the nameless woman, and even women in general, there is a propensity in the gospel stories for women to be named as sinners, and as such, an assertion or an assumption is made that they are sexual sinners. A classic example is Mary Magdalene. The women who followed Jesus are usually seen through our distorted prejudiced lenses that we have towards women, and our view of how we, pre of how we perceive women in, in the ancient world. Professor Levine is very helpful in this area, she notes that we now know that women in Galilee and Judea, for example, owned their own property and they did have access to their own money. In Luke 10, verse 38, Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. This means that she was actually a homeowner. The house church in Acts 12:12 12, 12 is in the Jerusalem house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. The woman who puts her coins into the temple treasury that Jesus comments on earlier in his time in the, in the temple precinct after the cleansing of the temple, shows that she has her access to her own funds, even if they are meagre. The woman who anoints Jesus has access to enough money to buy perfume that could support a family for a whole year. It's an enormous amount of money. Further, there is no reason to assume that she did not have access to even more funds. Professor Levine notes that there is no evidence to support the theory that these women, whoever they were, gained their money through sex work. They could have been gifted money by their family, earned it through their own work, such as textile work, including the dyeing of fabrics, pottery, healing, cooking and cleaning, and even, forbid it, investing their own money. Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene Joanna, the wife of Herod Antipas, his manager, and another unnamed woman named Susanna, and others served as patrons to the Jesus movement. Professor Levine goes on to say that these women were not seeking freedom from some oppressive or repressive Jewish system that devalued them. They followed Jesus because he spoke to their heart and healed their bodies. They found peace in his presence. And they too, and we too can find that same peace. I don't know about you, 
But I realize that I have totally misunderstood the presence of women in the Gospels, primarily due to my own lack of understanding of the Jewish background and the lens of patriarchy. And I am so grateful to Levine for helping me shift in my understanding and appreciation of these amazing women. And so we return to the story of the anointing of Jesus in Mark. When we think of our Athema Brisk, this nameless woman takes an enormous risk. While Jesus is there as a guest, and because it's in the town of Bethany, it's highly likely he is in the presence of friends, this is further suggested by the description that he is reclining at table. This woman is probably not invited. She has heard that Jesus is at the house of Simon, and being a person who's been healed of leprosy, would, he would be a notable person, just like that other famous resident of Bethany, Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. This is why she would know where to go and seek Jesus out. The story concerns a single woman, distinguished from among the privileged people, and the single woman displays an extravagant gift. In this case, she is silent. And in fact, in most cases of the women anointing Jesus, the women are silent. I'm not really sure why. Professor Levine comments that we are to see the woman first and then tell the story. So what do we see? What story do we tell? In the story of Mark and Matthew, the woman anoints the head of Jesus. Now this is different from the anointing in John and Luke, where it is the feet of Jesus that are anointed. The Greek word Christos means anointing, where we get the term Christ meaning anointed one, and Christian means little anointed ones. However, there are other terms that mean anointing and various types of anointing. In Mark's account, the term that is used to denote the anointing is meritso, which means to have myrrh put on one's body. Thus, we, thus the focus is not on divine confession or commission, such as the anointing of a king, but on the human body of Jesus. Our Lord says to her that, and, to the, and to the witnesses that she has, what she has done has prepared his body for burial. Thus, the meal is transformed into a meal of preparation for the death of Jesus, just as the Last Supper is also a preparation for Jesus' death. But in this case, the Last Supper is preparing the disciples and subsequent followers for the new paradigm of the rule of God. Professor Levine notes that there is still a royal meaning, however, to her actions, because the oil is poured over the head of Jesus, and oil was only poured over the head of a person if they were to be anointed the king. So the woman enters a dinner party that she is not invited to, the risk she takes is similar to the risk of a person newly walking into a church or a Bible study. It's risky, even frightening. Will I be judged? Will I be welcomed? Will I find a home here? Surprise, surprise. The woman is instantly judged. What a waste of money is the reaction of the guests. And it is a salient reminder to us to how we... To, to, to how we act towards those who are new in our communities. How do we judge new people or people we are not familiar with? I personally wonder whether the reaction of the guests is due to embarrassment, that they were not similarly generous towards Jesus. They were friends with Jesus. They had been given, um, they'd been, they'd been given this invitation, but they had not been generous towards him. Only Simon, who was hosting the party, is showing any generosity. So how generous are we towards God? Are we extravagant in our generosity of time, money, and our giftedness towards God? Or have we been dulled in our senses and become too familiar with God that all we do is attend church on Sunday, give what we have in our pocket as a last resort into the plate, and that's it? Are we generous in our attitude to others in our faith community and the world in which we live and move and have our being? Do we plan to spend time with God each day during the week? And I mean each day. The reality is that Mark's gospel, in it, sorry, the reality is that in Mark's gospel, outsiders tend to know who Jesus is 
and why he matters. And we in the church, through our familiarity, have had our senses dulled to who Jesus is and why he matters. Mark tells us that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, the inside women, have come to anoint Jesus at his burial. But they are too late. This nameless woman has already anointed Jesus for his burial, Mark tells us. And Mark also goes on to tell of the male insiders, the disciples, who do not stand with Jesus, but run. And yet it is a nameless outsider, a Roman centurion who has participated in the crucifixion of Jesus, who declares that Jesus is indeed God's son. Do we know the names of people who seek the same things we do? Might we learn from the outsider? Might we risk being the outsider who can do what those on the inside can't? Have we, like the women in the Gospels, allowed ourselves to be... Tr so will we allow ourselves to be transformed and changed in our encounters with Jesus in such a way that, like the nameless woman in Mark's Gospel, we can take risk and, ex and be extravagantly generous towards Jesus and those we encounter in our faith communities and in the world in which we live. The Lord be with you.